electronic control suspension system is an electronic system that allows the driver to select some suspension characteristics to suit the driver or the road conditions being experienced. In this program, we'll show you some service features and diagnosis characteristics of the electronic suspension system that you, the Mitsubishi mechanic, should be aware of when working on electronic suspension. We'll also identify to you the components that make up the electronic suspension system. Like all electronic systems, the electronic suspension system basically consists of sensors which monitor the vehicle condition or driver requirements and inform a computer or control unit. That control unit then processes that information and then controls the actuators of the system. With the active suspension system, there's basically, let's say, two things that are controlled, and they are the stepper motors, which control the damping rate of the shock absorbers, and we've got four individual damping rates that can be selected, right? So one of four conditions can be selected with the shock absorbers. And then secondly, the air pressure in the air springs, and there's one air spring on each strut. That air pressure is controlled, and it will control dive, that is anti-dive, the front of the vehicle going down, swat, which is the rear of the vehicle going down, anti-roll left turns and anti-roll on the right-hand turn, and overall vehicle height control. So in very simple terms, that's what the electronic suspension system controls. Now the sensors that allow the system to operate are firstly the indicator switch here, which the, the driver operates. So the driver selects which particular mode of operation he desires. Then we've got the door switches, which have an effect on vehicle height. The stop lamp switch, which affect vehicle dive a backup switch, backup lamp switch or inhibitor switch, a park brake switch, headlamp switch, a vehicle speed sensor, which is behind the speedo, throttle position sensor, height sensors, there's one height sensor in the front of the vehicle and one at the back of the vehicle, a steering angularity sensor, which is located behind the steering wheel, so it detects which way the steering wheel is being turned, a G sensor, which is in the front of the vehicle, detects movement of the vehicle, left or right hand. A rear pressure sensor, which is on this solenoid set here, this detects the pressure in the rear suspension. A high-low pressure switch, which is on this tank over here. And all of those sensors basically work on an on-off operation or variable resistance type. So they're basically fairly simple devices within themselves. They inform the computer of the vehicle conditions and from there, the computer controls the actuators. Now, the actuators on the electronic suspension system are firstly the compressor, which is mounted on the transmission, a return pump, which is located in this tank here under the right-hand front guard of the vehicle. We then also have stepper motors. There's four of these, one on top of each strut. They actually control the um, damping rate of the shock absorbers. And we then have 10 solenoids there's three sets of three, like this particular unit here, one located on the firewall, one in the right-hand side of the boot of the vehicle, and one underneath the right-hand front guard of the vehicle. That's nine solenoids. There's a tenth one. The tenth one is located on the compressor, so that's that solenoid there. So they're the actuators that make up the actual electronic control suspension system. So as you can see, the basic operation is like any other electronic system. Sensors that tell a computer what's going on, and that computer then controls the actuators. And that's the basic, simple operation of the electronic control suspension system. The only new adjustment introduced because of electronic controlled suspension is height sensor adjustment. And this adjustment is fairly simple to perform and once performed really doesn't need any regular checking. To perform the adjustment you firstly check the rear height sensor mounting bracket. You check the position of the bracket from the mounting bolt of the lateral rod. If that's not correct you move the mounting bracket to achieve the set dimension. Then with the vehicle on level ground and unloaded 
Start the engine up and select normal height. You let, then let the vehicle run for three minutes to make sure that normal height is achieved and also ensure that the alarm lamp is not on. You then measure the wheel arch, top of wheel arch to centre of wheel dimension on the left hand rear wheel and the right hand front wheel. If those dimensions are not within specification, you then adjust the height sensor rod, either the rear one or the front one, to achieve the specified dimension. Having done the adjustment, you then lock up the nuts and then recheck the specification of the top of the wheel arch to the centre of the wheel. Again, if it's not within specification, you'll have to obviously reset your height sensors. And that's the procedure, fairly straightforward, um, but as I said, once it's done, there's usually no need to redo it. There are other electronic control system sensors that are adjustable, things like the handbrake switch, the foot brake switch, the inhibitor switch, throttle position sensor, etc. They're not a specific adjustment for this system, they're the normal adjustment you would apply on those particular sensors. Another sensor which can be checked is this G sensor, which is located over here underneath the bottom of the left hand headlight. Although it's not actually adjustable, it's the mounting surface you check. The mounting surface here has to be vertical. Uh, and that's important to get, to get correct output from the G sensor. If it's not vertical, because the vehicle's been involved in an accident, etc., obviously the panel can be straightened or, if necessary, can be shimmed. The important thing is to have the correct output for the G sensor when the vehicle is in a normal attitude condition. Finally, we have this special tool which is used for disconnecting the one-touch type connectors on some of the airlines. Over here, on the solenoid set, you can see there's one-touch connectors. You just simply slide the tool into there, push it in, and then remove the hose. And that makes removal of the one-touch type connectors very simple. So as you can see, there's a couple of things on the servicing uh, and regular maintenance of the active suspension system, which are handy to know. If you don't know them, you could be wasting a lot of time trying to fix a simple problem. Like most of our electronic systems, the suspension system does feature a self-diagnosis system. In addition to that, we also have an alarm lamp up here on the indicator panel, and that lamp will illuminate whenever a self-diagnosis system fault occurs, so the driver is instantly warned of a problem with the system. Additionally, that lamp will illuminate for half a second every time the engine is started up, so again the driver is uh, warned that the lamp is working basically. The diagnosis plug for the electronic suspension system is down here and if you're not using the multi-use tester you should be using a voltmeter or an LED lamp to connect up to your self-diagnosis plug. Being a second generation system the type of codes are the long codes which precede the short codes. So for example if you have two long codes and four short codes it's a code 24. If you have four long codes and five short codes it's a code 45. And you've seen that on other videotapes. The other features of the self-diagnosis system are that it retains faults in memory and retains multiple faults. Um, and to erase the memory or to erase the codes from the memory, you simply disconnect the negative battery terminal. So it's a typical self-diagnosis system that we've seen on other of our vehicles before. But remember, it's a self-diagnosis system. It tells you a system fault. It doesn't specifically pinpoint a component it tells you a system is faulty. So that could be the component, it could be the wiring, or it could be the connections. And too many people get caught on that. They always go for the component, and many times it's just a connection or a wiring fault. So that's a self-diagnosis system for the electronic suspension system. The electronic suspension system can be checked with the multi-use tester and in fact quite a few checks can be performed with the multi-use tester so the first recommendation if you've got a fault with the suspension system is hook up the multi-use tester and see where the problem area is. So with your multi-use tester connected to your diagnosis plug and to your cigarette lighter or your battery leads, uh, I prefer the battery leads if you're working in the workshop 
if you're driving the vehicle on the road, the cigarette lighter obviously is the best way to hook up. So with the uh, unit hooked up, we can then select the model, and on this particular ROM pack, it's uh, model number seven. And then we select the system, which is the suspension system. And we then get a four menu screen. Now, the first check you can do is self-diagnosis, which is item number one. So if we select self-diagnosis, if there are no self-diagnosis faults, the unit will tell you that. Uh, but if there are self-diagnosis faults, be it one or more than one, it will also identify those. Uh, the screen has only a capacity of displaying three at a time, so if there are more than three, the unit will tell you that, and you can scroll between screens using the up and the down arrows, so, uh, and then it will tell you which ones it's showing you, in this case items two to four or one to three. So self-diagnosis, either there are no faults or there are faults. If there are self-diagnosis faults, it's telling you a faulty system, all right? So it's either the sensor uh, or the connectors or the wiring. So not just the component, don't fall for that trick. From there, we can go back to the menu by pushing the clear button. We can then check service data, which is item number two. So on service data, we're checking the inputs to the computer, basically. The first one we've got there is the G sensor, and that's a voltage reading. If you rock the vehicle side to side, that voltage will vary. Second one you've got there is the alternator output. So if the engine is not running, it should indicate low output. If the engine is running, it should indicate high output. Next one we've got is a low pressure switch. That's either an on or an off reading, depending on the condition of the low pressure switch, which is located on the reserve pump uh, unit. The TPS reading is next. So that's a, a voltage reading, millivolt reading, and that will vary as you alter the throttle position. Then you've got the high pressure switch, which is again either on or off, depending on the operation of the compressor. So that will go with the compressor. So either an on or off reading on the high pressure switch. The ignition switch again is either on or off, depending on the condition of the ignition switch. Then we've got the manual change switch, as they call it, which uh, the four switches up here on the indicator panel. With no switches depressed, we should have five volts. If we depress the high switch, we should have a slightly lower voltage. If we depress the soft switch, it should be a lower voltage again. The auto switch, lower again. And the sport switch should give us the lowest voltage. The headlamp switch is either off or it's on, obviously depending on the position of the headlight switch. The steering sensor is a steering, a steering angularity sensor in the steering wheel. So there are two sensors there, and they're either on or off, depending on the position of the steering wheel. If you move the steering wheel, you can see they just fluctuate between on and off. We then have the front height sensor, which will indicate the position of the front height sensor, which you can vary the reading by either bouncing the front of the vehicle or varying the height of the front of the vehicle. So the sensor will indicate the height setting that it's at. Next one you have is the rear height sensor, basically the same thing. So either bouncing the vehicle or varying the height will change the rear height sensor reading. Speed sensor, which is in the speedo, will indicate the speed of the vehicle. So obviously on the road you will get a, a reading there. The rear pressure sensor will indicate uh, a voltage reading, and that voltage reading will increase as the pressure to the rear suspension increases. So either by loading the back of the vehicle or increasing the rear height of the vehicle, that voltage reading should go up or down as you decrease the load in the back of the vehicle. Stop lamp switch, it's either off or it's on when you depress the brake pedal. Park brake switch, it's either off or it's on if the park brake is applied. On automatic models, uh, it will indicate whether the indicator lever or the select lever is in D, so it's either off or it's on if it's in D. And we've also the same thing for neutral and reverse. It's either off or it's on in neutral or reverse. Manual transmission models, when you select reverse, you should have an on reading. Out of reverse, it should be an off reading. Door switches that are either on or they're off. All four door switches uh, in this particular case, or the hatch. And then back to the G sensor. So they're the, the items you can check on service uh, data. Um, they are the readings that the computer sees. So again, if the reading is incorrect, it could be the sensor that's faulty, it could be the wiring, or it could be the connections, even the connections into the, uh, into the computer. So don't fall for the trap. If you've got something that's not behaving as it should do, you've got to check the whole system out on that particular component, the sensor, the wiring, and the connectors. So that's the service data. We can go back to the menu by pushing the clear button. And the next check we can do is an actuator check, which is number three. And 
On the suspension system, we can in fact do 10 actuator checks. The first one is soft drive. So if you wish to do a soft drive, you push yes, and the stepper motors will be positioned to the soft position, and that will also be indicated on the lamps here on the right-hand side of the indicator. If you don't wish to do that, we can go to the next one, which is auto soft. So again, uh, push the yes button, and the stepper motors will be positioned to the auto soft, which is a second firmer setting. Again, the indicator panel will indicate that for you. The next one is the medium setting, so push the yes button, and you will then have the third firmer setting set, and the indicator panel here will identify that for you. And the fourth one you've got is the hard drive, which is the firmer setting, so push the yes button, and all three lamps will be on, indicating you've got the firmer suspension setting set. And you can also verify that by bouncing the vehicle to verify the firmness of the suspension. You could also, if you wish, take the stepper motors off and verify that the actual stepper motors are turning. So that's um, how you can do those particular tests, which are the stepper motor positioning checks. The next one you've got is the compressor. By pushing the yes button, you'll activate the compressor, uh, and that will stay on for the three seconds. The next one you've got is the return pump. Pushing the yes will give you the return pump operation. Next one is height down. Pushing yes, and the vehicle will lower itself, and then after the three seconds, resort uh, or revert back to the normal setting. Height up, so you can simulate a height increase. Number nine is a roll to the left, so the vehicle will then activate a left roll, or anti-left roll, and an anti-right roll. So that obviously verifies a few of the actuators, quite a few of the actuators in the system. Obviously, if the vehicle does all of those uh, tests correctly, you haven't got a problem in those particular areas. So you've got quite a fair amount of flexibility uh, with the multi-use tester in the actuator test. Once you've finished with the actuator test, we can push the clear button, which will take us back to the menu. And we've got the number four, which is the special test. Now, in special test, there's several things we can do here. Um, we can do a drive recorder, or we can do a simulated vehicle speed check. Drive recorder, we showed you how to do that in tape number seven on the uh, fuel injection system of the Pajero. This is no different. That if you select drive recorder, you're basically going to check, or you're going to log in a number of sensors that you wish to monitor. So a full explanation of the drive recorder function is shown in video tape number seven, so I won't bother to give you that same explanation here. Simulated vehicle speed, we can do with this system. So if we push number one. The first thing it then asks you is to select whether you're going to go for miles per hour or kilometres per hour. Well, I presume we'd go for kilometres per hour in this particular case. And at that stage, if the vehicle was in a position where the vehicle speed sensor was on, it will tell you that and will ask you to move the vehicle so that the vehicle speed sensor was off. All right? So you will get that screen and to tell you to move the vehicle if the sensor was in the wrong position. Once the sensor is in the right position, you then get this screen. Um, which has got a sensor displayed on the top and a simulated vehicle speed on the bottom. And you've also got the freeze uh, sign, the F, on the left-hand side of the screen. We can move the F by the zero key or FO key, and by moving the F down, we can then scroll the top sensors. We can go from one sensor to the other, so you can actually look at a sensor at a certain speed. Once you've got the sensor you want, you can freeze it, and then you can go and you can plug in a vehicle speed. So you can, for example, uh, dial in, let's say, 100 kilometres an hour. Yes, and you've got 100 kilometres an hour. And obviously something is then happening. If you want to change that uh, signal, we can then say one kilometre an hour, and we can change it. So we can simulate a vehicle speed by pushing in the speed that you want pushing the yes key, and you then got that simulated vehicle speed. And you can then have the vehicle perform in the workshop as it would do on the road. So you can have the, the height going up and down. You can have damping rates changing. You will have compressors operating, return pumps operating. So there's quite a few things you can do there with vehicle speed simulation. You can accelerate by pushing the up arrow, and the vehicle will accelerate to a speed, as you can see here on the meter. So it'll accelerate up. And obviously, as we go through certain speeds, something will happen, or we can accelerate down. And as we come down through those speeds, 
will have sensors that reposition, lights that change, etc. So you can do a full simulated vehicle speed test in the workshop. It saves you going out on the road and possibly breaking the speed limit because some of the operating conditions of this system are above some speed limits in some states, so it doesn't get you into trouble there. But the main thing is it can verify the operation of the system. To get out of that screen then we can push the clear button and it tells you to disconnect the battery terminal because in doing a simulated vehicle speed check uh, we had an abnormal condition and some of the other electronic systems on the vehicle may have picked up a fault and would have detected then a self-diagnosis system fault and put that into memory. So once you've finished a simulated vehicle speed check, you disconnect the battery terminal to remove any of the self-diagnosis faults that would have been placed in any of the electronic system computers. And having done that, you can then push the clear button again and it takes you back to the main menu, to the four screen menu. And they're the things you can do with a multi-use tester. It is a relatively simple unit to use on the active or electronic suspension system, but it does rely on you knowing its capabilities. Right? You've got to have, obviously, an idea of what you can do with the multi-use tester. And once you've identified a fault, you've then got to trace that system. Right? You still have to go and trace a system. It doesn't, as I've said a couple of times already, immediately identify a component that's faulty. It identifies a system that's faulty, so it's restricted it from many things to one thing and you've got to then go and find that one thing. So that's how you use the multi-use tester on the electronic suspension system. Once you've identified a fault in the suspension system using either the multi-use tester or the self-diagnosis plug, you then obviously have to find where that problem is. In the process of doing that, it may be necessary for you to check at the electrical terminals here of the electronic suspension system computer. Just before I show you how to do that, remember it is an electronic system, therefore it has to be powered. And in the relay box under the bonnet, you will find three fuses there, which are used to power the suspension computer. Also, there's a solenoid relay in that area. And in the junction block under the dashboard, there's a couple of fuses there, plus a relay in that area as well. So don't forget those. When performing the checks at the suspension system computer here, um, it is advisable to have small probes on the end of your multimeter, otherwise you could damage the terminals, the small terminals of the computer itself. So you don't want to damage those, otherwise you'll cause some intermittent faults, etc. On the back of the computer you will in fact find there are four connectors. There's a 10-pin connector, a 14-pin connector, 18-pin connector and 20-pin connector. At these connectors we will do voltage and resistance checks depending on which particular sensor or component we are checking. So, starting firstly with the 10-pin um, connector, we'll do our voltage checks with the connector in position and the ignition on, and we connect our voltmeter to terminal number 5, we should have battery voltage. To terminal number 8, we should have battery voltage, and to terminal number 10, we should have battery voltage. Now, that's done with the connector in position. Then, we can do a resistance check, so remove the connector, and with our ohm meter, we check the resistance across terminals 1 and 6, which are the stepper motors, and terminals 2 and 7, which are the stepper motors. And we should have the resistance there. Terminal 3 to ground is our front left air solenoid. We should have its resistance. Terminal 4 to ground is the front right air solenoid, and we should have its resistance there. Terminal 9 to ground is an earth circuit, so we should have a good circuit to earth, continuity. That's it for the 10-pin connector. We can now go and check the 14-pin connector. So firstly, with the connector in position and the ignition on, with the positive probe connected to terminal 52 and the negative to ground, we should have around about 2 to 2.5 volts, which is alternator voltage. With the engine running, we should have battery voltage. Now next, with our negative probe of the meter connected to terminal 36 of the 18-pin connector, and we'll leave that there for the next few checks, so terminal 36 of the 18-pin connector, and then with our positive probe into terminal 54, we should either have 0 volts or 5 volts, 
depending on the position of the front height sensor. If you move the sensor, that will either be 0 or 5 volts, depending on the position it's in. You should also have either 0 or 5 volts on terminal 55, 56, and 57. Then, on the rear height sensor, with our negative probe still in terminal 36, on the rear height sensor, terminal 61, we should either have 0 volts or 5 volts, depending on the position of the rear height sensor. And at the same thing should occur at terminal 62, 63, and 64. And that's your rear height sensor. Then, your steering angular velocity sensor, with your negative probe still in terminal 36, at terminal 53, we should have either 0 volts or 5 volts. And at terminal 60, we should have 0 volts or 5 volts. And that checks your steering angular velocity sensor. That's it for the voltage checks there on terminal 14, or on the 14 pin connector. We can now disconnect the connector, change to ohm meter, and check the resistance from terminal 58 to ground. And with the speedo cable rotated, we should have an on-off situation. So we should have continuity to ground and an open circuit. Then at terminal 59 to ground, we're checking the high pressure switch. We'll either have a ground circuit or an open circuit, depending on the condition of the high pressure switch. So if you change the position of the high pressure switch, we'll then get that circuit changing. So that's it for the 14 pin connector of the computer. We can now go and check the 18 pin connector. So initially, with the connector in position, ignition turned on. And with our meter connected across terminals 25 and 36, we should there have sensor voltage. With our meter connected to terminal 28 and 35, we should have our G sensor output voltage, which should be approximately 2.5 volts, depending on the G sensor. If you move the vehicle, that voltage will fluctuate. Terminal 34 and 35, we should have G sensor supply voltage. Now, with the connector out and the ignition on, we check our voltage at terminal 26, and that's our solenoid relay voltage. Then, with the ignition off and the connector out, we can do some resistance checks. So the ohm meter grounded. Terminal 21, we should have front intake solenoid resistance. Terminal 22, flow volume valve resistance. Terminal 23, air compressor relay resistance. Terminal 24, front exhaust valve resistance. Across terminals 25 and 35, we should have rear pressure sensor resistance. And then terminal 27 to ground, we should have right rear air spring solenoid resistance. Terminal 29, we should have left rear air spring solenoid resistance. Terminal 31, exhaust solenoid resistance. Terminal 32, return pump relay resistance. Terminal 33, rear exhaust solenoid resistance. Across terminals 35 and 37, we should have the rear pressure sensor variable resistance. So if you bounce the back of the car, you should get a fluctuation in that reading. And then terminal 38 to ground, we should have low pressure switch condition, which is either on or off. That's an open circuit or a ground circuit, depending on the position of the low pressure switch. And that completes the checks you can do on the 18 pin connector. We can then go to the 20 pin connector of the computer. And firstly, with the uh, ignition on, we can do voltage checks at terminal 72 to ground. We should have zero volts if the vehicle is not in reverse and should have battery voltage if the vehicle is in reverse. At terminal 83 to ground, we should have zero volts if the brake switch is off or brake pedal is off, and battery voltage if the brake pedal is depressed. 89 to ground, zero volts if the headlight switch is off, and battery voltage if the headlight switch is on. So there are your voltage checks. Now we can do some resistance checks on the 20 pin connector. So firstly, terminal 74 to ground, with the doors closed, we should have an open circuit. With any door open, we should have a ground circuit. Terminal 79, we should have continuity between this terminal and the diagnosis control terminal of the diagnosis plug. And terminal 84, 
to the self-diagnosis terminal of the suspension system and the diagnosis plug, we should have continuity there as well, so between those two terminals. And terminal 90 to ground, uh, we check the switches on the instrument panel. So with no switches depressed, we should have an open circuit. With the sport switch depressed, we should have a small resistance. With the auto switch depressed, a bigger resistance. With the soft switch depressed, a bigger resistance again. And with the high switch depressed, we should have the biggest resistance of all. Now, we can do some checking on the indicator lamps. So with our terminal 20 still disconnected, but with the ignition on, so with our 20 pin connector still disconnected, with the ignition on, and just using a ground wire, we can then probe into the terminals here, and with terminal 71 grounded, we should have the buzzer sounding. Right, that's your warning buzzer, uh, and that should sound. Terminal 75, if that's grounded, the normal lamp should be off and the high lamp should be on. Terminal 76 to ground, the medium lamp should be on. Terminal 77 to ground, the high switch lamp should be on. Terminal 78 to ground, the auto switch lamp should be on. Terminal 80 to ground, the alarm lamp should be on. Terminal 85 to ground, normal lamp should be off, the low lamp should be on, and the soft lamp should stay on. Terminal 86 to ground, medium and hard lamps are on. Terminal 87 to ground, the soft switch lamp should be on. And terminal 88 to ground, the sport switch lamp should be on. That completes the checks you can do on the suspension system computer. You'll find in the service manual all those checks are covered. In fact, there are more than that covered in the service manual. They'll give you a choice of which particular type of testing you wish to do. What I showed you there was one version of a test for each particular terminal. Obviously, you normally wouldn't do all those checks in one hit because you wouldn't have everything that was wrong. You would have identified with the multi-use test of the system that was faulty, and you would only have to check that particular system. So it wouldn't take you very long, as long as you knew what to do. So that's the checks, and that's how to do them. Well, that's about it for the electronic suspension system. I'm sure you'd agree there's really no difference between this electronic system and any other electronic system when it comes to diagnosis. Obviously, the more you know about the system, the easier diagnosis is going to be. But even with the multi-use tester, you'll need a good knowledge of how to use a multi-use tester and the multimeter. You'll need a good working knowledge of the multimeter if you're going to get to the basic cause of the problem. You may initially think that active suspension is a difficult thing to diagnose, but I'm sure if you keep your wits about you, you'll be able to diagnose a system quite simply. Mm -hmm.